name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning to you. My name is H.L. Edwards, and I am the proud lead pastor here at the Merge Church, where we love God, we love people, and we absolutely positively love the experience. If this is your first time visiting with us, we want you to know we feel so blessed, we feel so privileged that you've decided to come and hang out with us on today. Uh, we know that there are many churches that you could have gone to, uh, but you've chosen to worship with us on today, and for that, we're so excited about that. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, about us by way of Facebook, and we bless God for Facebook. We bless God for, for Twitter. We bless God for Google because we're discovering that there are different ways that people are finding out about the merged church. And let me just share this with you, is that we want to be as real as real can get. We just want to be honest, and we want to be truthful uh, with you. We're glad that you are here. We're so glad uh, that you're here. Well, if you got our newsletter uh, on this week, uh, you would have noticed that uh, we, uh, uh, we came out with there was a, a challenge that I was going to make today uh, for those of you who are in attendance. Uh, now, this challenge, I wish I could say it was for everybody, uh, but it's not for everybody. Uh, this challenge is a, is a challenge uh, for those of you who are married. For those of you who are married, this is a very special challenge to you. Uh, this month, uh, we're in a series entitled Sex Drive, uh, God's Plan for Sex. And because we're in this series, uh, one of the first things that God told Adam and Eve to do was to be fruitful and to multiply. He didn't say uh, how often. He just said to do it. So this is my challenge to you today, those of you who are married. My challenge is, and in the event that your spouse is not here, you make sure that you go home and you tell your spouse that Pastor HL has issued us a challenge. And this challenge is simply this. Y'all ready for it? You excited about it? Kind of curious about it? Well, men, I know you're going to be excited about this. Because when I shared it with my wife, I was excited about this. Our challenge for the whole entire month is for the husband and wife to be obedient to what God has called us to do. Okay, let me say it another way. Show your wife how much you love her each and every day. Because one of the beautiful things that God has given to us is what we call a sex drive. Men, please say amen right there. God has given it to us. And because God has given it to us, listen, let's celebrate that thing. So every day, if possible, uh-huh. You show your wife and wives, show your husbands how you feel about them. And make love to your spouse. Amen, somebody. I'll pat myself on the back for saying that. Because dealing with this topic when it comes to sex, it is really in the church, a taboo subject. It's something that we really don't deal with. And if we don't deal with it in the church, and we are hesitant about talking about it in the church, our young people, as well as ourselves, will get the idea of what sex is based upon what they see on television. And God deals with sex. As a matter of fact, he deals with the pros and he deals with the cons. He, he shares with us that sex is good, it's real good. But it's got to be inside the will of God. As a matter of fact, some of us, uh, we did the uh, survey in the uh, newsletter. And we said, ask me anything. And at the conclusion of the service, we're going to answer some of those questions. As a matter of fact, some of the questions that we answer, 
there are some real questions. In fact, if you go to the book of, uh, uh, of, of, of Solomon, uh, come on, um, Sons of Solomon, you will discover that we serve a God that is awesome. And we'll see that Solomon is a man that loved his wife, and his wife loved him. I, I want to start off by defining what sex drive is. Sex drive is the urge, or it is the desire to engage in sexual activity. Now, that's what the dictionary says. The sex drive is a desire that we're born with. In fact, studies show that the man's sex drive is higher than the woman's sex drive. Now, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Uh, our sex drive is really a good thing. It's not a taboo subject. It's really a good thing because it is something that God gave to us and it's for God's glory. Now, I know that that sounds kind of crazy that God gave us a sex drive for his glory, but he did because when God created male and female to engage in sex inside his will, it ultimately brings him glory. So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about sex, and we're going to answer some tough questions about sex. And my prayer is, is that the conclusion of this series, we as a church will grow to understand God's plan for sex. Now, do you remember when you were growing up, that little nursery rhyme? And just for the sake of argument, I'm going to use myself as well as my wife as the example. It went something like this. Scooter and Yamika sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Yamika and Scooter with a baby carriage. Now, in a crazy kind of way, that rhyme really paints a picture of what a healthy relationship looks like. Have you ever thought about it? You got this couple, Scooter and Yamika, and they first, they fall in love. Baby, I love you. I love you too. After they fall in love, what do they do? They get married. They, they don't do nothing else. They, they get married. And after they get married, they come along with a baby carriage. But here's my question. What's happened to that picture? What happened to falling in love? And what's happened to getting married? And what's happened to having a baby? Where, where, where did it get mixed up? It seems like that somebody altered the picture. They have rewritten the rhyme and now the rhyme sounds something like this. Scooter and Yamika sitting in a tree. They, Yamika says to Scooter, well, you better get your hands off me. They never fall in love. Didn't think about getting married. And here comes Yamika all by herself with three more baby carriages. As a culture, we have drifted so far away from God's plan for sex. We've rewritten the script. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to say this, that we as a culture, we have what is called a sex problem. We have a sex problem with our young people. We have a sex problem with our adults. We have a sex problem with our young adults. We have a sex problem with, seri with singles. We have sex problems with couples. We just have a sex problem. And it's just not a problem that people have that's outside of a relationship with Christ. In fact, it probably affects individuals who have a relationship with Christ more than anyone people that are in the church and because the church has been so silent on the issue we just allow it to exist 
You know what I've discovered is that we have a, we have a great knack for dealing with the problem instead of preventing the problem. And the way that you prevent the problem is that you talk about it. I want to be honest with you, and I want to be transparent with you. So please don't judge me. Because as a young Christian, and as a growing Christian, I had a problem with sex. I was proclaiming that I love God, but I was still doing my own thing. As a married Christian, as a preaching Christian, I had a sex problem. I was looking at pornography and wanting my wife to do what I saw. See, here's the mistake that I made. I knew that Jesus died on the cross for me. I understood the fact that I was saved. And I knew the fact that when Jesus died, it protected me, his death protected me from the penalty of sin, which is death, eternal separation. But it did not protect me from the presence of sin. And that's where we mess up. Because we think that we can actually be in the presence of sin and being Christians that it won't affect us. That's the biggest lie the enemy ever told us. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says this. Be self-controlled and on alert. Your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And let me be honest with you. When it comes to some sin, we ain't got no problem with that. We can be on our guard. We can be on alert because it doesn't really affect us. But when it comes to this sexual sin, we can fall victim. Because the reality is that sexual sin is so enticing. The reality is, for some of us, We've been involved in sexual sin. And let me just be clear about this sexual sin. It's not necessarily only engaging in intercourse with someone that is not your spouse. But sexual sin is anything that you do to satisfy your sexual desires by stimulation with the intent of an orgasm or ejaculation. I told you today we're talking about this sex problem. The Apostle Paul, he, he actually addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 18. And, and in just a few minutes, Antonio is, is going to put it up here. But let me just kind of give you the background of what Paul is, is writing about. Uh, this is his second letter to the church at Corinth. Now, Corinth was known for a lot of things. But unfortunately, Corinth was known for it was a place where sexual promiscuity was rapid. In fact, it says that prostitution was not only accepted, but prostitution was embraced. Now, Paul's letter to the Christians that were in Corinth was to address them because the church, the men of the church, the women of the church, they were conforming to the ways of the culture. And Paul's concern in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 18, was that Christians were indulging in sexual sin, and they felt like that it was okay. They were doing what the world was doing, and they didn't have a problem with it. Notice what Paul says beginning at uh, verse 12. It says, I have the right to do anything. Paul says, that's what you're saying. But Paul says, but not everything is not beneficial. He says, I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food is good for the stomach and stomach for the food. God will what? Destroy them both. The body, however is not meant for sexual immorality, 
but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body. For it is said, the two, what? Shall become one flesh. But whosoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Verse 18, the A clause simply says this. Flee from sexual immorality. Can I show you there are three ways that sexual sin affects us. We think that it's, it's really not a big deal. We think that we're okay in doing the stuff that we're doing. You know how I know we think it's okay? It's because I've been there. I've worn the t-shirt. I'm not going back because I love my wife and my family too much. Paul says that these things they're killing us. First of all, this is the first thing I want you to understand. That sexual sin is selfish. Sexual sin is selfish. Notice what he says in verse 12. He says, I have the right to do anything you say. Now let me explain this to you. Paul was saying, Paul had actually written them a letter in advance. And he had given them some words of encouragement. And in those words of encouragement, Paul made the statement that I have the right to do anything. And it was speaking in terms that he is no longer, or we are no longer under the law, but we are under this thing called grace. But these men, these women in Corinth, they had literally taken what Paul said and took it out of context and tried to justify what they were doing. Paul is saying this, all because it is acceptable in the culture doesn't mean that it's a good thing to do. He says, now remember, in this culture, casual sex was a common thing. In fact, it was an accepted practice. In Corinth, the place to get your sex on was to head up to the nearest temple. And there at the temple, you could meet a temple prostitute. And you could actually handle your business at the temple. And nobody had an issue with that. There were men that were in the church that were taking part of this, taking part in this. But Paul says, even though you think that you can do what you want to do, what you're doing, is it the right thing to do? Is it helpful to the kingdom agenda? Is it praiseworthy? Will it bring honor to God? Or is it just for your own self-satisfaction? When you say, I have the right to do anything, the question I want to ask you, even though you have the right to do anything, is it for your own satisfaction or is it to the glory of God? Now, this uh, past couple of weeks, I've been doing my own little uh, research. It's nothing really official, but I just wanted to ask random people by way of Facebook um, how they view sex. Because I know how I view sex. Let me rephrase that. I now know how I view sex. And I'm just, just kind of curious to ask them, how did you view, view sex? And it was very interesting. I got some very interesting uh, answers. One person said it like this, sex is like an itch that you got to scratch. Another person said, uh, hey, man, I, I ain't going to lie. God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And I just love women. One person said, before I was married, it really didn't mean anything to me. But now that I am married, it means something to me. Finally, one person said, man, 
I just needed to do it because it made me feel good. The one thing that was common in all of these answers is that it was for self-satisfaction. Sexual sin always looks looks out after number one. It looks after itself. You have the right to do it. But does that mean that you got to do it? You have the right. You have this liberty. You can make your own choice. But are you willing to deal with the consequences? Sexual sin is always a selfish sin. Guys, you single, don't get mad at me, but I got to tell you something, ladies. All because he says he loves you don't mean you got to give it up to him. All because he says he cares about you doesn't mean that you got to give it up to him. If he's saying he's going to leave his wife, there's a good chance he's going to leave you as well. It's time out for us falling for the okie doke. It's time out for us falling for the guy that has the smooth talk. Paul says, you can go ahead and do it, but is it beneficial? Because sometimes, guys, we're in for it for ourselves. And nobody else can care less how she feels. It's about me getting mine. As a matter of fact, I got this question for you. Once it's all said and done and the babies come, does he make a guest appearance or is he living up to his responsibility? Too often we see stories where young ladies are taking care of babies by themselves. Why? Because that dude said it's all about me. Guys, can I share something with you? I, I got to tell you about some of, some of the ladies. She dressed like that on purpose. She wants to lure you in. Don't fall for it. Because ultimately, it's going to lead to your destruction. Paul says, listen, when it comes down to this thing that's called sex, sex is not about being selfish, but sex is about being selfless. When they say that I love you, this is it, here it is, Corinthians 13, what does Paul say? He says, love is what? Patient. If he want what you got, what Beyonce say, put a ring on it. It's time out for us just falling for anything and doing things outside of God's will because they have consequences. So sex is not about being selfish, but sex is about being selfless. Paul was right. You have that liberty. You can make your choices. But the reality is, is it going to bring honor to God or is it going to bring honor to yourself? And secondly, sexual sin is a controlling sin. Can can I say this again? I, I need you to get this. Sexual sin is a controlling sin. As a matter of fact, let me just pause right here, and I've got to go off script because Paul deals with this thing called sex. Because it's something about sex that it will reach out, it will grab you, and before you know it, you're gone. Here it is. Sexual sin is a control of sin. Notice what verse 12b says, the second portion. It says, I have the right to do anything. Again, that's what they're saying. This is their mantra. They're saying, Paul, listen, you've already wrote this. You said that we have the right to do anything. But then notice what Paul says, but I will not be mastered by anything. That was Paul's response. Paul says, listen, you do what you're going to do, but don't allow it to control you. This is what Paul is saying. Oh, man, this is, this is, this is, this, this is, I think this is deep. When you play around with sexual sin, Sooner or later, it's going to be your master. It's going to control you. Paul says that you guys, 
You just can't get enough of it. Every time I, I hear about you, you guys are up at the temple getting your freak on. And it's not even bothering you. You don't even think there's anything wrong with it. Because you're thinking just like the world. Paul says that the only one that should have authority over you, we'll see it a little bit later on, but he says the one that should have authority over you is God. He, he's the one that has con- authority over your body. But the other person that has authority over your body is your spouse, your husband, or your wife. It belongs to them. It belongs to God. You are not your own. You've been purchased with a price, and that was the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul says if you have this liberty and you connect yourself with a prostitute or someone that is not your spouse, he says as you give them the same authority over your body as you do with your spouse and with God. Here's why sexual sin is so controlling. It takes us where we said we would never go. It it takes us to a place we we said we'd never go. Maybe it was a a relationship. You you know that relationship was no good, right? You, You knew you had no business whatsoever with that knucklehead or with that girl or with that woman or with that man, but you went there. You know why? Because you were just kind of curious. You were toying around with it. Maybe it was you were on the computer and and, and, and you saw something. You saw this woman that looked so fine and and you just kind of clicked on there. And all of a sudden it seems like she's talking to you. And you click again and you click again. And the next thing you know you're seeing all of these men's daughters, brothers, sisters, Kids, mother, posing, showing everything that they have. Why? It's because you you, you dabbled a little bit in sin. And it never starts off with intentionality. It's just that you're a man, she's a woman. You're single, they're single. You're married, she's married. You're married, she's not married. He's not married. It starts off with a, hey, hey. Starts off with a casual conversation. And you know, let me just be honest with you on this. We serve a God that knows all things, sees all things. He don't predict anything. He just knows it. And in your spirit, you know you have no business whatsoever talking to him or her. And you can't continue on with the conversation. Then all of a sudden, you just become friends on Facebook, Google+. You exchange phone numbers. You're texting. You're going out for coffee. You're doing stuff that you know that if this is the line right here, You're already over here. It takes you where you don't want to go. Because you said that I can control myself. That's a lie. I know what I'm doing. That's a lie. You ignored the warning signs. And now you're in too deep. You want to get off of that website. But you're just going to look at just one more picture. Now you want to be creative and you make up terms. I ain't telling you something I heard. I'm telling you something I know. It takes you where you said you would never go. It keeps you longing longer than you're willing to stay. In other words, you're in too deep. You're in over your head. You've already crossed the line. You want to get back on the other side, but you know what? It's going to happen. You know how powerful sex is? It it creates a bond. 
between two individuals. That's why when you're in a relationship and you're not married, the breakups are so hard. You know why? Because you've already done did the sex thing. And there is a bond between the two. And it's hard to break away. Because you're doing things that's reserved for marriage. If you're married and, and you've gone the other way, it's hard for you to leave him or it's hard for you to leave her. Because you've already did the sex. And it's just so powerful. And you're in too deep. Perhaps you've you, 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 you said that you can handle this, this porn thing. You said that you can get, you, you, you don't have to watch it no more. But you go away on a business trip or you're at home by yourself and you find yourself, I'm just going to look at one thing, just, just one thing. She happens to be my favorite or he happens to be my favorite, whatever the situation is, and you find yourself in it too deep. And here's the interesting thing about porn. They say that sex sells. They ain't never lied about it because it does. Because in the porn industry, it is reported that in 2005, $10 billion was made off of the porn industry. That's in 2005. In 2012, the numbers have gone up. It keeps you longer than you want to stay because you're in too deep. And thirdly, it costs you more than you're willing to pay. In, in other words, you, you never thought that it would cost you so much. You, you never thought that being in this relationship with this person was going to cause you so much hurt and so much pain. You never thought that being in this relationship with this person was going to cause you to lose your family. You know why? Because it costs you more than you're willing to pay. If you're, in, if, you're, if you're watching porn or you're looking at porn, you find yourself visualizing and fantasizing and wanting to go out and satisfy your desires because you want to experience what you saw in that movie. I remember uh, when, when I was younger, uh, I, I remember this one situation. Uh, uh, this was actually when Yamika and I, we were actually engaged. And if you are engaged to get married, uh, one of the things that you have to do is that you have to uh, take this thing called the AIDS test, okay? You, you got to take the AIDS test. And I knew what my past was like. Can I just be quite honest with you? I was scared as hell. I started reading up on it, trying to figure out what are symptoms and signs if you've got HIV. Because I knew what my past was like. And I'm thinking to myself, God, I love this woman, and she ain't going to marry me if I got HIV. It costs you more than you're willing to pay. Because of my past, I'm thinking it's going to cost me the woman of my dreams. And when I went out to the mailbox, and I got a little letter in the mail, and it, 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 it said that, uh, that I did not have it. it. It put it in such a way. Well, I didn't know if I had it or I didn't, and then I had to look at it and read it again. And, and when I didn't have it, I, I, I'm like, woohoo, thank you, Jesus. I called, my, I called my fiance at the time. I said, baby, I ain't got AIDS. Okay. Paul is saying that the only one that has authority over your body is God. The only one that has authority over your body is your spouse. I have the right to do anything. And if I connect myself to a prostitute or to someone that is not my spouse, I give them the same authority as my spouse. Paul says this, listen to me. He says, if you get involved in this sex thing outside the will of God, it will control you. And thirdly, here it is, sexual sin perverts the body. Sexual sin perverts the body. First we, we, first, we say this, is that sexual sin is a selfish sin. Secondly, we say that sexual sin is a controlling sin. And thirdly, and fa lastly, sexual sin is a sin that perverts the body. And this is what he says in verse 13. 
You say that food is for the stomach. That's what they were saying, right? He says, but, 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 but food is for the stomach. Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for the good food. But God will destroy both of them. In, in other words, he says, listen, we've got this desire to take care of our appetites when we get hungry. They're saying, listen, we've got the same uh, desire to take care of our sexual appetites when we get a little, uh, when we want some. And Paul says, no, that's not it. He says, God's going to destroy that. He says, this about the body. The body, however, is meant, the body, however, is not what? Meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God will raise the Lord from the dead and will raise us also. Do you not know that the bodies are members of Christ? And if we are members, how shall we unite them with the prostitute? Never do you not know that he who has united himself with the prostitute is one with her. This is what Paul is saying in a nutshell. Because we are Christ followers. Your body is the temple of God. If you have sex with a prostitute or someone that is not your spouse, what you're doing is that you're defiling the body. You know, here it is. This is, this, this is the illustration that I want to give you. Back in the day when, before Jesus came in the Old Testament, we saw how the high priest was the only one that was able to go into the temple. The high priest was the only one that was able to go into the temple. And the purpose of the high priest going into the temple was that he was to represent the people and pray on behalf of the people. If anyone else went into the, the, the temple inside the holies of holies that was not the high priest, if they were struck down dead or they were cursed. Listen, our body is the temple. Our body is the temple of God. I tell my daughter. I don't, we don't, and I'm just going to be honest with you, we don't, we don't say, you, you, she knows, she's going to learn that stuff in school, but I want my daughters to understand what they have is sacred, and what they have is, is righteous, and what they have is a gift from God. And I say that, 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 that your vagina is called the glory. Your vagina is called the glory. And Harrison, what you have, your penis, is called the covenant, it's the promise. I know y'all think I'm crazy. But I want them to understand that it is deep. Check this out. Too often, we've got this, these fake high priests trying to enter into the glory, trying to enter into the holies of holy, and we're messing things up. We're defiling the temple. God says, you keep that temple holy. Because the holies of holies are reserved. They are a gift from God. It's reserved for your husband. Reserved for your wife. So as I close, so what does it look like? God's plan for sex in our lives. Number one, it's between a husband and a wife. That's who sex is for. I, 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 I know that you're young. In, in chapter 7, Paul says this, listen, if you can't wait, he says, go ahead and get married. It's better to marry than to what? Burn. He says, if you don't have that kind of control, he says, go ahead and get married and make the thing righteous. But secondly, it's not about being selfish, but it's about being selfless. God's plan for sex is it's not about me, 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 but it's about us. Sex is about oneness coming together. Thirdly, is about your spouse having control over your body and not sin having control over your body. And lastly, it's about remaining faithful to your God and to your spouse. Every head bowed, every eye shut.